Well, here we are again live in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, as always, Hank Garner. Today joining me is Beth Raymer. She is the author of a brand new book. It released two days ago on Tuesday of this week. It's called Fireworks Every Night. And this is this is such a ride of a book, I have to tell you. Um, <laughs> this is... I, I can't even think of a word or a couple of words words to sum this up. It is it is a it is a ride for sure. And I think I think people are going to love this book. Uh, it is a fun and fascinating and heart wrenching and heartbreaking and everything in between. It's it's <laughs> it, excitement to, um, you know, the the realities of life. And it's you so encapsulated. Um, a time and place in this book. And uh, I, I love it so much. And I know other people are too. Welcome to the show, Beth. Hi, hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, Beth, I like to start the show with a, a fun question sometimes just to kind of set the set the tone. Um, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, I became a writer so late in my life. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't even know if I, I have a memory. I think, you know, I moved to New York City when I was 24. And I moved here from Las Vegas. Um, I was not a writer or anything. And I met friends. A lot of my friends that I happened to meet, I moved here to box in the Golden Gloves. And I met a circle of people who were all artists. Um, a lot of them were writers. And I loved hanging out with them. And I was a reader. Um, one person who became a friend of mine, Robert Annecy, he was actually my sparring partner. I had read his memoir, The Gloves, um, and very first person, uh, just this is life in amateur boxing. And I loved that book. And when I moved to New York City, I got in touch with him and he became my sparring partner. He took me to parties. He, he introduced me to New York. And I think I saw the writing life through him. And I was kind of like, you know, maybe I could do this. If Robert did it, maybe I can do it. So I think that was when I had some kind of energy in my head going toward being a writer. <laughs> I love it. Um, did you ever consider yourself um, a storyteller or a collector of stories uh, before that point? Because, you know, looking back over your bio, you've had, you know, a, a roller coaster ride of a life, which, you know, a, a lot of us, um, you know, if, if you're a writer, I have known a couple of people and we've done over 1500 uh, writer interviews uh, with authors and very seldom do you uh, interact with a person who says, I've only always wanted to be a writer. That's the only thing I could ever imagine myself doing. And my sole purpose was to do that. That That is a very minuscule amount of people that can say that most people you know, it's a bit of a circuitous route that, uh, you know, you collect experiences over here and you collect experiences over here and all of the, 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 the things that you've experienced kind of coalesce into this gumbo that, you know, makes the writing life. Um, did, did you ever consider yourself as like someone who collected stories or, you know, were, were you ever that person at the party that's like, Oh, let me tell you this story. <laughs> I wasn't that person, but most of my friends, um, they kind of referred to me as like an experienced junkie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was such a, I was kind of a loner in my 20s. I was moving around a lot, Las Vegas, New York. Um, I went to, I lived in Costa Rica, Curacao, uh, all over the Caribbean. And I was really by myself. I was working in sports gambling at the time. And so I didn't really have, I had my community of gamblers, but they were much different from me. They were men, much older guys. 
So I was really the only woman and I was always writing to my friends and I would write letter emails at the time. I can't believe how many emails I would write. I would get home <laughs> from a long day and like write this really passionate email to my, to, you know, a whole bunch of different people. And they would, and a lot of my friends kept those emails or like, Beth, you should use this. You need to do something with this. And so I think, um, you know, friends would read my stories and then they kind of guided me. I, I did I did hit a wall in my late 20s where I really had no idea what I was going to do for a career. Um, I had this resume that was, it, it very much read like a rap sheet. I mean, it was just illegal activity <laughs> after illegal activity. And I would try to apply for jobs. Like I had a lot of my gambling friends who were like, Beth, just work on Wall Street. I can get you a job. You'll be great. But then I would look at the lifestyle and I was like, there is no way I'm going to make it in corporate America. There's just like there is no way I'm going to get on that train every day and get up on the Wall Street station and sweat over numbers for the rest of my life. And so um, finally, I was very thankful. Again, I had friends kind of guide me into the arts, even though, of course, their lives were completely degenerate as well. And they were also poor. And, <laughs> but there was something a little more like I felt like I could almost handle the degeneracy and poverty that comes along with the writing life much more than I could handle the degeneracy and the I don't know, that all consuming kind of shallow Wall Street life. Yeah. Your experiences in Las Vegas uh, culmin culminated in the writing of a book that then became a very popular movie, Lay the Favorite. Um, what, tell me about that experience. Well, first, how did you wind up in Las Vegas doing what you did? And then um, how did you take that experience and decide to write about it? Oh, gosh. I don't even, you know, I moved to Las Vegas when I was 23. I had been a stripper in Florida and I had um, some, some bad experiences. <laughs> I mean, they weren't even that, they were really bad. I didn't think they were that bad at the time. But again, friends were like, hey, this seems a little dangerous. <laughs> and they're like, you know what, you should do something else. And I was living in Florida. I grew up in Florida. I, I went to community college in Florida. I went to Florida State. And I was like, I want to get out of Florida. So I had this idea to move to Las Vegas and be a cocktail waitress. So I moved there. It was very hard for me to get a job. They were unionized. I didn't realize all that you had to go through to be a cocktail waitress. So I just started waiting tables. And I happened to meet this young woman. She was about my age. She was in her early 20s. And she was a masseuse uh, for a gambler. And she said, look, I know this guy who runs this gambling office. You should let me introduce the two of you. And so I went to his office and this ended up being this guy, Dinky, who was like the biggest, you know, sports gambler in Las Vegas. So very quickly, like I became his right hand woman. And then before I know it, I was like going offshore and going to New York and working for bookies. And that was about three years and kind of like stripping it too kind of became dangerous, <laughs> even though same thing, I think it had been dangerous all, all along, but it took like three years for the awareness to like kick in. <laughs> um, and once again, friends were like, Beth, like, what, what about this? Why don't you try to go into writing? And I was a reader. I love reading memoirs. Um, like I mentioned, Robert Annecy, The Gloves, was a, a, an inspiration of mine. This, a, a woman, Lily Barana, wrote a memoir called Strip City, where she kind of just writes about her last year of stripping and stripping in all these strip clubs across America. So I liked this notion of using my life, my experience, to just write a first-person account um, that explores a subculture. And I thought, wow. That actually sounds kind of easy. I think I could do that. Um, it wasn't the most ambitious project in the world. And so that's when um, I, I was dating a reporter and he had gone to Columbia and he said, let's you know, use your emails that you've written me and let's just use that for your application. And I got into Columbia and very quickly, I, I learned how to write a book. I learned how to write a book proposal because at Columbia, I went to the MFA nonfiction writing program. You learn a lot about writing. Um, 
But it wasn't until I took a book writing seminar, uh, Sam Friedman taught it at the, in the journalism school at Columbia, that I learned how to like sell a book. What, you know, I learned the business of publishing and that allowed me to sell the proposal of Lay the Favorite very quickly. I, I got the agent, the publisher, I sold the film rights. That all happened very, very quickly. Um, the film, the screenwriter finished the screenplay of Lay the Favor before I finished the book. So that was, you know, <laughs> that's how that world works. You know, yeah. there's not, uh, they are on a whole different type of energy and focus in Hollywood. Um, and, and writing a memoir uh, is very different from writing a piece of fiction. Well, for a number of reasons, but we'll, we'll just talk about the publishing side for a second. Um, you, you actually sell a proposal for a memoir before you've written all of the book is and whereas fiction most times when you sell a a novel the the agent and the publisher they pretty much want a finished book before they make a decision on it so that that had to be different that that okay i've sold this thing but it doesn't exactly exist yet <laughs> now i've got work to do um, yeah, it like, it adds some pressure, certainly yeah. with Lay the Favorite, where I, you know, it all happened so quickly. I had never published anything before. Um, but I happened, I actually sold the novel on proposal. Um, nice. It, just because Lay the Favorite did well and I was, I right. wanted to keep momentum and my, my editor at the time and publisher, Julie Growl, it, it was at Spiegel and Growl then, it doesn't exist anymore, but or it does, but it's not under the Random House umbrella anymore. But they said, you know, just come up, you know, write about what you want your novel to be. And I did. I wrote like a 10 page document and that's how I sold it. So I've never gone through the process of writing something first and then trying to sell it. I've often wondered when someone has such success with their first book that they've written, um, Lay the Favorite was a, a wild success. It was a great movie. Um, and, uh, you know, when you go to follow that up, when when it's come out and you get all the, the praise and the accolades and the movie comes out and everyone loves it, and then a few months later, the lull kind of happens and, you know, there you're sitting again with, you know, what do I do now? You know, I had, what, what is that feeling like having that kind of success right out of the gate? And then everyone starts asking, well, Beth, what are you going to do now? Uh, well, I think that's why, I, you know, I'm a very just antsy person. I mean, right when Lay the Favorite came out in 2010 and I sold my novel, I think it was 2011 or 2012. I don't know, but it was very quickly. I didn't let myself get to that point. I just did it again. I just sold my third book. I, I anticipate that I might dive into that. Oh my God, all I'm doing is staring at my computer all day like, or whatever it is. Um, I don't want to get there. So I always make sure I have something to work on, something to sell, something to look forward to. It's kind of like, you know, success and failure are not that different. No matter what, you have to keep going. Right. You, you just have to, you have no choice. So <laughs> whether you have a huge success, it doesn't matter. People forget about it very quickly. Yeah. So you just have to kind of plan ahead. You do have to plan ahead for just how to keep your career going and your sanity. And we, we have a saying that we um, use a lot. The, the blank page is the great equalizer. It, it doesn't <laughs> matter how much success you've had in the past. When you sit down to write a new book, Everyone stares at the same exact blank page exactly. and, you know, that, and that's a, that's a, a humbling, uh, but it can be very empowering at the same time that, you know, I, I have just as much opportunity now with this new story that hasn't been realized, you know, as, as everyone does. Yeah. And plus there's the feeling like I've been here before. Right. You know, so that gives you some confidence be like, you know, I actually, I went through a lot with Lay the Favorite. I wrote it fast and stuff, but there I there were some roadblocks around along the way and I got around them and I will do it again. So there's just you have to stay confident. 
Yeah. You also have to stay delusional. I think it's those two things, confidence and delusion, that you just have to really keep that <laughs> brew going. <laughs> your, your new book, Fireworks Every Night, is your first work of pure fiction. Is, mm -hmm. Do I have that right? Um, telling a story that is fiction, but it feels very true, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, like, I... I don't know, um, but I'm guessing that you drew pretty heavily from some personal experiences. Um, that experience versus Lay the Favorite, where you're telling your story and, and is these are your experiences. Um, how different is that? You know, going to the to the well and, you know, mining out your personal experiences versus writing where maybe you start with a feeling that you had or an experience you had, but then you embellish and you, you know, tack on this or you strip away that and, and then it becomes something different. What, what's the, what's, what's the difference in, in your writer's mind between telling the, the true facts of what happened with you in your life versus just making it up? Um, you know, the truth is I approached fireworks every night, just as I approach nonfiction. Um, it is very heavily based on my upbringing and my life. So for many years and many drafts, I did what I always do in nonfiction. I take my recorder, I take my iPhone, I go, I record, I recorded my family members, I interviewed them, I interviewed sister's ex-boyfriend. I went through everybody like to get a hold of the atmosphere. I moved back to Florida just to wow. get the atmospherics. I do what I always do, which is almost like this, like it's like method acting, but it's writing. Um, I don't know how to, I'm not someone who could like invent something from nothing. I yeah. come from like, I really use my own life. Um, so that's how I approached it. But with fiction, because it's fiction, at some point you do need to take the leap of imagination to break the story open. Yeah. Um, so that part was very hard for me. And my editor was very helpful. Andrea Walker at Random House, you know, she was like, we need to frame the book. That's when she said it can't just for a long time. It was a traditional coming of age story. Um, yeah very much like We the Animals by Justin Torres. That, that's what I wanted, a very small, traditional coming of age story. And my editor was like, no, let's open it. Like, uh, let's do the dual timelines. Let's bring in present day Cece, our main character. Let's put her in the here and now. Have more fun with this, make this bigger, open up some themes. Let's give her a job. Where is she in life? So I was like, okay, I can, I can do that. So, and even though I still borrowed from my life heavily, even with that, it did free me up in terms of um, theme and fun. You know, I gave her the job working at the zoo, which brings in this whole theme, like this whole uh, theme of survival and the animals and the wildlife. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how I approached it. I don't think I'm a very much a, you know, I'm not a pure purest fiction writer I'm just <laughs> well, the, the dual timelines uh were, were so brilliantly done in the book and the book opens um with the first thing that you encounter in the book is this harp um you know and we we learn over the next couple pages that that this is the eve of Cece's wedding and she uh, is in this home of her in-laws and there's this this object there that really um, sets a tone for that portion of the book. And I, w using that object as kind of an anchor that that was, I, I kind of thought about this over and over again, that, you know, this, um, this object is the first thing you encounter in this book. And it's at such diametric opposition. to the other <laughs> yeah. that it, it really it, I, I'm I'm struggling for words, but it really serves as a contrast piece. Maybe is the um, yeah. what, what was the idea behind this object that you opened the book with? Well, you know, so CC. I, that's a it's a great question. Let me think <laughs> about how to answer it. 
my book, there is a lot of imagery in the book. And I think I was very focused on this, if, on the stark juxtaposition. I wanted it to be as stark as possible between CC, this family she's moving into, what her new life is about to be like, and where she's coming from. Um, so I thought like the harp was just such a image of <laughs> just wealth and care, the carefreeness that comes with wealth and the beauty and just, um, but also kind of a, a little bit, oh uh, God, what's the word? You should, I don't know. There's something like if I had Marie Antoinette's harp in my living room, I think I would be a little bit embarrassed. About, like just, you know, I'd be a little bit yeah. embarrassed, but you know, they're not. It's this beautiful object. It, it travels to all these different museums and conservatories and like everything, they're, they're just not the most self-conscious people and they're very giving and they're, they're into the arts. And this is, there's just this, such an acceptance about who they are in their lifestyle where Cece is just coming from a place of absolute shame. Right. Um, <laughs> so that, and I, and then, you know, we go to chapter two, right after the harp and the, the engagement party. And the first image you see of Cece's upbringing, it's the tray of orange samples and like there's flies on them. Right. You know, so it's also like, okay, so very stark in, in the, in the compare and contrast. And it, like, this is a whole new world we're entering. What's, what's funny to me is Cece almost seems to be more of a snob um, <laughs> than, than the people that you would expect to be snobbish. They're very You're open so and right. welcoming and very uh, giving and, you know, just salt of the earth people. And then Cece is so full of shame. Like, I think yes. that's, that's a perfect that she almost becomes a snob. And I know. I She's thought that was a beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that tells us so much about ourselves when you, you know, like, oh, this is, you know, you it seeing that played out that way really makes you look at yourself and your own experiences to like, oh my gosh, do I come across that way? I hope I don't. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> It's crazy. It's crazy. But it was it was beautifully drawn. It was beautifully drawn. Thank you. Um, the cast of characters in this book are phenomenal. And I think central to the cast of characters is Florida itself as a character. Um, I live in the deep south, close to Florida, but not in Florida. Um, but we we where, travel to Florida. A, what's that? Where do you live? We, I live in South Mississippi. So okay. but very close. Uh -huh. um, but we travel to Florida quite a bit. And you know, there's something about crossing that state line. <laughs> yeah. where, you know, all, all the all the memes over the last few years of Florida, man, you know, are are hilarious um, to me. But, you know, all great um, memes are, are really dabble in a little bit of truth. You oh, yeah. know, that that's what makes them resonate so well. And it's kind of funny, you know, that that. It's obviously an exaggeration, but a little bit, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's a little bit of truth there. Oh, yeah. um, but the way you represent Florida in the 90s is uh, what, what was your idea about representing this place the way you did so that it feels like, you know, it's it's a character in the book? I mean, I think that was just a priority of mine. I feel very loyal and I feel devoted to Florida. I mean, it shaped me. I love Florida. I feel like I lived in New York now for some, I'm, I'm, I am a New Yorker, but I have this very strong inner Floridian um, yeah. that I'm proud of and that I, I, I defend the state of Florida. So I wanted to just get it right. And I wanted to capture the wildness, the beauty. It was so unhinged even back then, but it's, it was the starting of everything, you know, yeah. it's the starting of, of where we are now in the state of Florida. You see the, um, there's this part where CC's in school and, you know, they go to, they have portables. Did you go to school in portables in Mississippi? Um, like the, the temporary buildings? Yeah, they're like chicken coops, like on the, on the, 
I don't even, on the cinder blocks and yes. you're like sinking yes. through the swamp yeah, while we, you burn math. <laughs> we live in a, in a part uh, of the country where we get lots of tornadoes and okay. there were, there were several that damaged buildings as I was coming up. And, and so you would have these portable buildings that they would bring in while they repaired things. And yeah, there was, there was a lot of that. Right. So see, exactly. So CC is in one of those and um, at her school and she's like in middle school at this point and an alligator starts, you know, coming up the, the, the handicap ramp. Right. To the <laughs> and the kids are all like, oh my God, the gator is coming. And yeah. the teacher is like, um, you know, kids, this is Florida. You have a better chance of dying by legal execution than you do a gator attack. <laughs> and that sets the tone because by the time right. he's in high school, she does have classmates who are on death row. She does have one who is on that's on trial facing the electric chair. You know, and like that teacher was right. You know, the larger force at work in Florida is the the values that are coming from this very distinct, uh, you know, <laughs> governance than it yeah. is the the concern of the gators and the little wild loony things that go on there. Um, it's uh, it, it's interesting to me to think about um, the family that we inherit. Um, none of us get to choose what family we're born into or <laughs> who our relatives you know, are or were or what things we inherited from them. And, um, you know, Cece's shame of of her family and her past um, really comes full circle for her in this book. And there's a lot of. Um, you know, from the mother who was in her thirties going on 17, you know, yeah. th was, was a brilliant way to, uh, <laughs> to do that to, when, you know, were these themes, I, I guess what I'm, what I want to know is, were you thinking about these themes from the beginning or was it like a lot of books where you write w what you're feeling and then at the end you look back and say, oh, there's all these themes that have cropped up in here. I didn't even know I was wrestling with these things or thinking about them until I wrote them, you know, like there's some very strong themes in the book, but did you know about, no. did you purposefully pursue them going in or did they emerge in the writing? They emerged. I am not, uh, I, not only am I not a big idea, like I have a hard time. Like I remember at Columbia, some of my classmates were so good at like, I'm going to write this story and it's going to explore this, this, and this. And I'm like, God, how do they know? How do they know that? Like, it takes me two full drafts before I know, before I can see some cohesiveness in terms of themes. Um, right. I think uh, I think the difference is a lot of those a lot of my classmates at Columbia they had been in therapy they had studied English they had been in honors English places where you really are you start training to like be reflective and think in those terms where I did not come from that kind of world I was just coming from here's a crazy story you know that's right. just very soap opera <laughs> right um, so yes those those themes just all emerged. I think it's like if you just try to tell the story and not think of those big things, um, or at least that's what I do. It's a little easier for me to just get the story on the page. That is the focus. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of topics in the book that are that that could be very difficult. Um, you know, th there's a lot of heavy stuff in this book, but uh, at the same time. CC uh, is, uh, you know, a little snarky. Um, she has a, a bit of an attitude and she never seems, especially young CC, she never really tends to take things too seriously, even though they're serious all around her. Um, did, is that a reflection of, of you and, and how you saw the world or, what, what was the idea of kind of coming up with the character of Cece and, and how she would interact with the, the world and the circumstances around her? Well, I think I just wanted to really show what it's like to grow up in extreme dysfunction. And when you're doing that and you're kind of in a place like Loxahatchee, it's the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, 
and you're just going through life. Like you don't really have time to think about things. No one's sitting down and teaching you words to attach to what you're experiencing. You're just there with your little 15, 16 year old brain being like, okay, what can I do? School's going to be so embarrassing today. How am I going to get through it? Can I somehow steal the car? You know, you're thinking you've got like the, the brain of an alligator. It's the size of a pea, you know? So something, sometimes things do hit her, but usually she's just anticipating how to get through the next day. So I don't think, um, CC really is able to reflect and make sense of her narrative and her past until she's in her thirties. I think only then does she allow herself the time and she has the experience now of another side of America that she's able to say, Oh, what I experienced was really fucked up. I think that's very true for anybody who goes through a dysfunctional home. Um, yeah. Like she is. Titles for books are uh, are fascinating because you've got this, um, you know, book that's you know eighty ninety thousand words, and we're going to sum this up with a a, a a quippy phrase, you know, or something that's going to you know tell people on the shelf what this book is about. Um, Fireworks every night is uh, is a fascinating title to me. Where did it come from, and? What do you think it encapsulates for the book? (laughs) Well, it came from a brochure that my father had when we, um, Florida, the state of Florida did this campaign in the eighties to get people not to just vacation in Florida, like, but to live there. Um, so my dad somehow had this brochure and it was, (laughs) I wish I could find it. It's almost like not to be believed, but it really had things just like, women windsurfing it was still a vacation brochure like it's not like they showed homes or anything or schools it was still vacation florida but it was like hey you don't just have to visit here you can come and stay and we have you know we have really good seafood and you can drive on the beach and there's fireworks every night and i remember just that was it was like sitting on the counter for a while and I remember the picture was like just this generic picture of like you know fireworks and that just always that stayed with me. Um, and so I just thought it would be a great title because it captures the thrill, you know, ca- fireworks every night, you know, it's, it's so thrilling. It's so sexy, but it's like to really experience fireworks every night is enough to drive you mad. Yeah. Well, and, and, <laughs> and, and it also, um, you know, fireworks, uh, you know, in, if you're talking about interpersonal relationships and family, yeah. um, fireworks are not always a good thing, you know, <laughs> and, and, and when you, you think about, you know, being in a family where there's fireworks every night, that's, yes. that can be stressful and, uh, you know, something that you would want to move across the country to avoid and yeah. <laughs> not invite your mother to your wedding, you know, because there are fireworks every night. That's Right. That is a great dichotomy in the title, I thought. Thank you. (laughs) Well, Fireworks Every Night is available everywhere now. It came out a couple of days ago. Go visit your local bookstore, support local books, and pick up a copy. Or we're going to put links to it in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon or Audible. Have you listened to the audiobook? of it yet beth no have did you i, I haven't yet but yeah, uh, i was yeah, thinking yeah. about picking it up for the uh, <laughs> for the holiday weekend coming up i, I would <laughs> like to experience the book all over again you know with with someone um acting it out so yeah. that's uh, but we'll put links in the show notes uh if people are just discovering you and want to follow along with you know what all is coming up with beth Raymer, is there a place where they can connect with you online and follow along I mean, I'm on Twitter, Beth Raymer, and I'm, I have my Instagram, which is Beth Ann Raymer, A N N E. I'm not. I need to get better at social media. I'm kind of <laughs> well, very we'll shy when it comes to social media. But. Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> link we'll link those up uh, to make it easier for folks to find you. Uh, okay. Beth, this has been so much fun chatting. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much for taking time to come on the show. Well, thank you for having me. This was fun.